Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for what is our last uh, <clears throat> thematic session of the Youth Ideathon. Uh, since we went into lockdown here in Uganda, we've been running these thematic sessions under the Youth Ideathon, and uh, the purpose has been to really rally young people to venture into the world of enterprise and entrepreneurship. Uh, we know that usually when the chips are down, that's when entrepreneurs step in the ring, and we are preparing young people really that have simple business ideas or complicated business ideas to actually bring them to life. So my name is Dennis, Dennis Aguma. I will be moderating today's session. I'm the founder and the chief executive here at uh, NACE, although some other people call us uh, NASA. Uh, but really what we do is we offer practical, hands-on, co-curricular entrepreneurship education, uh, really focusing on uh, youth and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, maybe just to give you some uh, very quick update on uh, where we are with regards to the idea uh, As I mentioned, NACE is a social enterprise that uh, was registered in 2015 with support from Kingston University in London. We've gone on to work with quite a number of UK universities, including the University of uh, Surrey, Anglia Ruskin University, and Birmingham City University, where I am doing a PhD in entrepreneurship and lecturing there as well. Um, but as well as the UK universities, we work <clears throat> heavily with uh, Ugandan universities, the likes of Makere and others. Indeed, some of the pictures I'm going to share with you are from some of the LEAP conferences that we've done, where some of our panelists, uh, like uh, Alan Wakatungu from CENTE, have been very kind uh, to join us in the past. But of course, because of lockdown, we're not able to uh, run these kind of sessions. So thanks to our friends at the UNDP, we are now uh, uh, running these sessions um, uh, online. Uh, bear with me one second. Yes, so everything is now online. Our vision is to leverage the power of entrepreneurship to achieve social economic uh, transformation. And as I mentioned, one of the things we do, the four key things that we focus on is inspiring one is about skills. Uh, in the subsequent parts of the youth idea zone, there will be an element of skilling and obviously incubating. Uh, the winners will be incubated for at least six months, giving them a fighting chance. And uh, the other one is dissemination of grants, uh, small and big grants, such as the ones that are available as part of the youth idea zone. <clears throat> as I mentioned, we do this through practical hands on co curricular entrepreneurship uh, education. Our focus mainly being uh, students before they leave school and get into the world of work, uh, we actually send them out into the field to come up with products and services. This is a, a short clip uh, from Makere University, Cobhams, the College of Business and Management Sciences, where around 1,300 students from our second year, <clears throat> as you can see, they're exhibiting their products uh, and services. So this is not theoretical entrepreneurship. This is real practical hands-on entrepreneurship where students actually go out in the field youth, they go out in the field and come up with real products and services. You can see all their packaging. You can see real products, uh, metal, name it. They're all there. People producing fertilizer, people producing uh, charcoal briquettes. Uh, we've seen yogurts and all sorts of uh, products and services. So we're really excited about this approach. Everyone keeps talking about this skills gap and everyone is trying to firefight them once the students have left uh, the uh, vocational colleges and higher education institutions. We reckon the best way to do it really is to support the universities and colleges and schools alongside whatever the students are studying to equip them with entrepreneurship skills. And entrepreneurship skills are lifelong skills. They include communication. By the time you bring this product to market, you have to communicate it. They include, um, uh, they include uh, innovation and creativity. They include uh, negotiation. They include all sorts of uh, skills that employers actually out there are looking for. So we think this is a, is a fantastic way of delivering uh, entrepreneurship skills or generally skills. Uh, so what is the Youth Idea Fund? Every business starts with a simple idea. And um, the Idea Fund really is focusing on an entry level. The Idea Fund is an entry level opportunity uh, designed to inspire you to generate your ideas and pitch your ideas. Uh, so we're focusing essentially on uh, is there a problem that you're trying to solve and what is your solution? Is there a pain that you're trying to relieve and what is your solution? 
Uh, we've also designed an interactive uh, IP and digital platform that the mentors are going to be using to log in to protect your ideas. In fact, uh, one of our panelists is an expert in intellectual property and we're going to dig into a few questions. Uh, if you've not received an email inviting you to log into this dashboard, please do. It's a very helpful interactive digital platform that gives you an opportunity to comment uh, on your idea, to update your idea, to send messages to the judges, for instance, back and forth. You can log notes, you can schedule activities, you can put attachments. Uh, when we get to the pitching stage, uh, everyone's going to have to attach uh, some kind of business model canvas. Um, the other thing to mention, of course, is that the ideas have been incredible. We have received over 3,400 bright ideas and counting. And these are not just simple ideas. These are really, some of them are sophisticated and complicated that we think will need uh, some intellectual property support. Uh, of these, at least 500 uh, need help with intellectual property. We think the ideas are that brilliant. And while initially we were planning to have uh, just 100 ideas, we're already having discussions with um, the UNDP to see how this number can be increased because the ideas are so brilliant, it would be a shame to just let them pass. Uh, in case you're just joining us, if you have missed uh, some of the stages that we've been through, uh, there's been an application process which is finishing, uh, I think, today or this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so if you've not signed up, please do sign up. You have probably a day or so to wrap this thing up. Uh, right now, we are running what we call thematic sessions every week and every day we've been dealing with a simple theme. Uh, we started with healthcare, agriculture, tourism, and so on. Uh, and today is about uh, science, technology, engineering, and maths, and what other people call ICT, which is uh, information and computer technology. Uh, from the 2nd of August, everyone will join us for a one week long marathon of what we call the Real Idea Fund, where we put your ideas through a pace. Uh, and in that bootcamp, the outcome is that you should be able to pitch your idea in a template uh, similar to a business model canvas. So if you're on this and you've used the business model canvas, that is the standard that we're going to use. There will be two key uh, documents. One is the value proposition canvas, which is really focusing on the idea. And the other one is the business model canvas, which is looking at the business within the idea and how you're actually going to execute it. Really simple to, um, uh, canvases. If you've used them before, by all means, go ahead and begin to crack on uh, and we'll take you through that process and improve them as we go along. Uh, perhaps one last uh, thing is to thank our panelists really for sparing time to join us. Everyone's working from home. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're not working. So we know that uh, any amount of time you spare is really valuable to us. We've, uh, we've seen how much is involved in terms of uh, uh, the hunger for young people to join some of these and the questions. Uh, some of the panelists have been staying behind with me for an extra one hour. So we know that this time is very valuable and we thank you very much for spending time to join us. And of course, all our support partners, partners uh, that have made this uh, possible. Uh, the UNDP Accelerator Lab team, one of whose representatives is here, Barnum Gemma, I'll introduce her very shortly. And of course, the resident representative for her passion uh, to support young people. Uh, women, especially in particular, uh, rural uh, participants, we don't take this support for granted. Uh, perhaps one last thing to mention is we have a sign language person. So if you're inclined to use sign language, uh, please keep an eye on the screens. There will be someone uh, that should be doing the sign language. We are also using on the Zoom link uh, chat. Um, I think texts keep popping up. So you could actually read those, but we found that sometimes the system, because it's using a uh, artificial intelligence. Sometimes the system struggles with our African accents. So don't be surprised if uh, it brings up wrong, uh, wrong words and things like that. And of course, we live on social media. Please do follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I think the handles, if you can see them, please do follow, especially if you want to get the, uh, uh, the recordings. All these recordings are available on our YouTube channel. So please go onto our YouTube channel. At this point, I'll ask my colleagues to share these uh, links within the chat so that you can go ahead and subscribe and follow all the content that we've generated up until now and the subsequent contents will be uploaded thereon. So without further ado, let's get into what we're all here to do. 
Uh, here is uh, my distinguished uh, panel that is, uh, bear with me one second. Oh yeah, sorry, I was just getting rid of some uh, IT issues. So my panel today is a fantastic panel in the ICT space. One of the key questions we've been having, uh, I think there's a panel we held and someone did mention that where are the youth on this panel? And I think everyone will agree that the panel we put together is youthful, although I'm sure uh, my colleagues like Alan will disagree that they're youthful, but we do, we do still think that they're youthful. So on the panel today, I'll let them introduce themselves and some of the products and services that they're working on. Uh, first one is uh, Solomon Alvin Kitumba. Uh, Solomon, if you've used, um, for the benefit of the listeners, if you've used Swipe to Pay, these are the guys behind Swipe to Pay. And I'll let uh, Solomon explain very briefly about Swipe to Pay, but good to have you. Uh, the next one is uh, Aaron Rakatungu, who is the CEO and co-founder of Sente. Again, uh, you may have used Sente without you realizing, uh, but Alan is equally passionate entrepreneur with over 15 years experience building successful products. Uh, I think you've also ventured into some um, uh, mobile sport betting and things like that. Essentially, he's a software developer who likes to play around with ICT and technology stuff. Uh, thanks for joining us, Alan. I'll let you uh, talk about uh, Sent very shortly. The other one is uh, Patrick uh, Mugisa, Mugisha, who will also call Mugi. Mugi, good to have you. Mugi is, uh, is a commissioner in the Ministry of uh, uh, Science, and uh, he is in charge of innovation and intellectual property management with the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation. So some of uh, the questions we've been having, uh, and I must say at this stage, um, thank you, Mugi, for all the support you've given us up until now in terms of uh, making sure that the idea from, from an intellectual pers uh, property perspective that we are uh, in conformity and for all your support. Thank you very much. Mugi is a, is a synthetic organic chemist uh, by, by, by training. Um, I think he did uh, medical chemistry and drug discovery. So some interesting stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, your, uh, what you're able to share today. The next one uh, is uh, Phyllis Chomahendo. Phyllis is a very passionate uh, social entrepreneur. Um, one of the things when people talk about ICT, they don't usually look at it uh, from a public health point of, of view. Uh, Phyllis holds a master's degree in public health and he is a medical radiographer by profession. And she's going to talk to us about MSCAN, uh, for which she is a co-founder. Lastly, but by no means least, is Banner, who is a huge innovation enthusiast currently working with the UNDP, uh, with the Innovator Lab. Uh, innovation is really at the heart of what she does. She's very passionate about empowering young people, has over 10 years experience in the telecommunications sector, driving the rollout from 2G to 4G. I think we're missing you on the 5G aspect. Vanna uh, holds a master's degree in uh, business administration from the University of Nicosia and a BSc science degree in electrical engineering from uh, Makerere University. Colleagues, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, at this stage, I'd like to perhaps uh, stop sharing my screen and join you back on the main Zoom call. Bear with me one second. Uh, my technology is, is getting ahead of itself. Uh, bear with me. Okay. I'm back. Colleagues, thank you very much for, for joining me. One of the things we uh, usually do, uh, especially by my colleague, Ben, who has abandoned us today. Ben has been doing uh, quite a number of moderations uh, for the Youth Ideathon. He normally runs through on a chat box to see who is where, and this will be a good time to do it before we introduce our panelists. We'll let them talk about themselves. So if you could use the chat uh, facility to please let us know uh, who you are, where you are based. Yeah, we've been seeing people from uh, from Congo, from uh, Burundi, from London, would you believe, uh, from uh, all sorts of uh, parts of, of, uh, of, the, of the country. Um, so I'm seeing some, uh, Brian Onechan, an architectural design landscaper. Fantastic, good to see you. Um, yes, someone from uh, Aleb, Good thought district. Which one is that? I've never heard of that. Bunoti from Bale. Good that you could join us. Uh, Mohammed from Lubaga. Uh, Dennis from Entebbe, namesake. Good to see you joining us. 
um, someone from Soroti, Bridget from Maya. Maya, is that a district in Uganda? Uh, Mukono Kayunga, uh, quite a number of you uh, across the whole country, Gayaza, Mbuya, Njeru, uh, someone from Hoima, Elizabeth from Hoima, uh, someone from Wakiso, Kaganga, Godfrey from Rukunje district, uh, Murije Murije, uh, Robert from Amuria district, Gulu district, someone from Mukono, Alan from Mukono district. Uh, someone is watching us in the supermarket in Chanja. Fantastic, <laughs> very serious, passionate. Uh, Kakai Diana from Kabale district, uh, my hometown. Good to see you guys joining us. Um, this is very interesting. Uh, Raji Rajab from uh, Kapchowa, Sebei region. Fantastic. This is one of the things I love about this idea from that someone's from Nakasongwara, uh, from Masaka, that we've kind of transcended the whole country, actually. So I find that very interesting. Please continue to chat among us yourselves in the chat uh, facility. And now let me get back to our panelists. Perhaps best to start with, um, let me see, let me come to uh, Phyllis, Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Chomhendo. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. Um, when we talk about ICT or information technology, when we initially started this uh, project, the idea was that uh, I think the category was called ICT. And then having the several discussions, we realized that actually ICT is usually a red pairing, but beneath that is science, technology, engineering, and math, which is why we renamed it to STEM. And I'm glad that you, you're joining us because you can demonstrate that uh, ICT transcends not just technology, it goes into solving real issues and real problems. Uh, can you please talk to us about, um, obviously yourself, how you ended up in uh, in ICT and uh, how you ended up in MSCAN because your background is uh, is uh, is uh, is not necessarily ICT, is it, Phyllis? Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Chomhendo Phyllis. I am a director and co-founder at MSCAN Uganda. We are developers of low-cost mobile ultrasound devices that we use to go to several low resource settings across the country and provide much needed ultrasound scans to pregnant women who cannot access um, the conventional ultrasound machines. So yes, my background is in healthcare. Um, I have a bachelor's degree uh, in medical radiography and MSCAN came about as a solution to a very big pain point. Now, during medical school, we're usually posted to different law resource settings across the country to practice our craft. And radiology um, includes things like ultrasound, CT scans, MRI, ETC. And I was posted to a March Health Center 4, and that's in Lira District in Northern Uganda. No electricity, no sign of development, and I was expected to practice my craft. So basically, I could not practice um, radiology in such an area. And unfortunately, I kept seeing so many women dying due to conditions that I knew could have been scanned on ultrasound and prevented early. So there's nothing worse than feeling like a useless health worker. And we realized that this is the, this is actually the narrative in so many areas across Uganda. So when we got back from COBAS, uh, my colleagues and I decided to come up with a solution that could help us bridge that gap between um, the services we're providing and the people um, in the low resource settings across our country and also across the world. So that's how MSCAN was born and we had to jump <laughs> uh, into the deep end in terms of ICT in order to uh, develop the product because it's both hardware and software and we had to learn so many ICT related things on the way. But then I've always been passionate about STEM and I'm also currently part of STEM Queens which is a mentorship uh, organization that encourages girls to join STEM. Yeah. Thank you very much, Phyllis. One of the things you mentioned or touched on is this distinction between hardware and software. And I think often uh, people think ICT is the same. And uh, uh, can, you, can you mention, can you try and elaborate for our listeners who are on here that actually there is a career in either side of thing. You could be a software engineer like uh, Alan and just focus on coding and things like that. But ultimately, sometimes you need a physical hardware on the other side to respond to the, to, to the, to the instructions of the software. If you could help our listeners to, 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 identify, 
to kind of decouple these two so that they understand that there's a distinction between hardware and software. And specifically with 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 the with MScan, uh, how do you go about getting your instructions, the software, to talk to the machine? How does that work? Yes. Um, so uh, MScan works on the basics of ultrasound. Um, that sound is just, I mean, that ultrasound is just sound at a frequency that the human ear cannot perceive. Um, our journey in ICT started at Uganda Industrial Research Institute, and that's where we got to also learn these things that there's a distinction between hardware and software, that fine, you're going to make the machine, but you have to make the software to communicate or to instruct the machine. Now, that instruction in terms of MScan, uh, we have a device which uh, most people in ultrasound know um, has something called a listening crystal and a talking crystal. Sound is sent and then received in terms of binary data. And that binary data is what's sent to the software to convert binary data into images. Those babies that you see on ultrasound, it starts out as binary data. So um, that communication or that instruction um, from, from the software is what turns uh, whatever information we've gotten from the machine into something that we can then interpret. Well, I'm not a, a pro at software engineering or hardware engineering, but that's what I can give as an overview that you make a machine, but then you have to have an instruction which is within the software. One of the things that you are, um, you are highlighting very well, and maybe, maybe this might be a good time to bring in one of our other panelists. One of the things you're highlighting very well is that you do not have to be an IT wizard to come up with an IT product. I always say, even on some of the lectures we've delivered on innovation, that technology is an enabler. It's not an end in itself. And sometimes you come up, you find people who are designing fancy tech kind of related products, but they've missed the real thing beneath. Uh, why is this technology being deployed? And I find that often the simplest technologies are the most impactful. Maybe on this occasion, I'd like to bring in, um, uh, perhaps if I go to uh, Solomon. Solomon, uh, could you uh, introduce yourself and talk about uh, Swipe to Pay, your, one of your products? I, I, when I was reading uh, uh, some of the stuff that you've been involved in, I know everyone will talk about stuff today, but you've been involved in quite a number of things, haven't you? So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, guys, and, and uh, uh, very good morning to everyone uh, on, on the on the channel today. Uh, my name is Solomon Kitumba, and I'm the founder and head of product at Safe to Pay. Uh, I'll say I, I call myself a serial entrepreneur, not because I have any successful preneurs, but because I've been around the block for quite some time. So uh, at Swipe to Pay, we're literally building uh, enterprise tools, but for small businesses. Uh, for them to, uh, to access uh, credit from banks and MFIs using business performance data. So we'll, uh, we realize that um, many small businesses are still living below their full potential because of uh, limited access to meaningful finance. And when I say meaningful finance, they usually resort to, um, to money lenders with exorbitant um, interest rates. So banks cannot look at them, microfinance units cannot look at them because they don't have books of accounts, uh, no collateral. And these are things that banks look at to um, uh, uh, to take on the risk to, to lend to you as a small business. So many of them don't have this. So we are looking at what we call alternative credit scoring models for them to access credit from banks and MFIs. So uh, we, give them, uh, we give them an app for them to manage inventory sales and expenses. On top of that, we built a dashboard for what we call absentee business owners. I'm Solomon, but I own a business in Nigeria. I can easily track uh, how my business is performing. On top of that, we built a payment layer for them to accept any other mode of payment other than on top of cash, I would say. Uh, we built, built a model for them to be easy to um, to uh, set up online stores uh, amidst this pandemic. So it, it's easy for them to sell without having to pay our developer to build with them a, a web shop. This is something that we've been doing for um, for the last four years, and uh, it's an interesting journey. Uh, twice as hard. I myself, I went I went to law school for uh, for two and a half years, dropped out, taught myself code. And here I'm trying to like change the world with programming. Uh, <laughs> I was actually going to ask how you ended up because uh, I read somewhere that you you initially went into law school and I just couldn't get yeah. my head around law school and ICT. So how yeah. did that transition happen? Were your parents yeah, so happy I, when you when you actually I dropped mean, out of law school? Parents will never be happy after uh, giving a lot of tuition. <laughs> so uh, my dad was never happy. Hated me for some time. But anyways, how I ended up into tech was I, I went for um for internship with a tech company. 
And uh, these guys were saying things I'd never heard of in my life. Uh, so I was there as a, as a legal intern, paperwork and all. But then I got bought into technology. I used to take notes every day about uh, the fancy things these people are talking about. But I had an, I also had a lot of time on my hands. And I usually tell guys, if you're, if you're in school or doing internship, the only thing that you have is time to like learn all the concepts that you can actually get. So I, I, I used a lot of YouTube to, um, to, to uh, educate myself about tech. So at first it was, it was just fancy that I was getting to know these things. Uh, literally did I know that I was actually getting bought into a very, uh, very robust um, uh, marketplace, I would say. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's hard to exhaust and, and I keep educating myself every day. Yeah, I taught myself code and, and here I am, I, I write code, I do business development consultancy. I am now into uh, product management and consultancy. So these are things that I educate myself about every day, but still around the same scope of tech. Fantastic. We always, uh, one of the things uh, Nest does, it has a component of inspiring. And um, one of the things we have in our pipeline is internship programs for to give young people actually a chance because often we find that career guidance um, is usually delivered in uh, from from from, uh, from from a perspective of the parent often uh, or maybe the teacher that who may also have never been exposed and we think that uh, these internship opportunities are a great way to give young people an opportunity to try things out uh, so i hope that uh, the next interns are listening in and taking advantage of the internship opportunities and learning one of the things you talked about is in terms of uh, credit referencing and things like that is the issue of registration so yesterday we had uh, a session on um, uh, smart cities and things like that and one of the key things that came up was that the businesses must register that they must be organized in such a way that uh, government and other institutions can actually take them seriously to give them these opportunities obviously when you're starting a startup in tech it's a different story than if you're uh, asking Kampala City Council Authority to give you the right to redesign a whole street. Uh, that's a different ball game. You need expertise of a different nature and you must be able to demonstrate all that. Uh, but my experience working with startups is those, and this is one of the key things about the idea thought, that it's an entry level where, uh, and I'm speaking this uh, very well knowing that uh, our partners, for instance, the UNDP have been very generously giving grants of between 10,000 to 40,000 uh, you know, US dollars, but by the time someone gives you 40K, it's understandable that they want to make sure that you are a real business, that you're registered, that you have bank accounts, you have a track record and so on. Uh, but for the first time, we're now getting into a situation where we're saying, no, 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 these barriers, we need to remove them for our young people. And working with startups, often there is no, no you don't even have breakfast, let alone uh, rent for your office. You don't even need an office. Often you just need your laptop and perhaps some data uh, so maybe on this occasion, uh, I would like to bring in um, uh, Alan, Alan Rakatungu, uh, who is the founder and CEO at Sente. Uh, Alan, um, first and foremost, how different is Sente from uh, Swipe to Pay? Alan, can you hear us? Yes, yes, Dennis. Um, so that's a, that's a good question I've not thought about. But uh, from the way uh, Solomon explained uh, Swipe to Pay, they are looking at leveraging. Uh, they're, they're looking at leveraging uh, payment data and uh, to 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 give credit to businesses. Uh, we as Sente are a digital uh, account or a digital business account. Um, we also target uh, mid-market and up, so mid-market businesses and enterprise businesses, um, and we give them a digital account. Uh, so whilst today you can go to a bank account and get checks and get, uh, you know, start doing your expenses uh, using cash, uh, with Sente, you get a digital account. Uh, you, you Now then after that you have... Uh, you can pay with smart visa cards. Uh, you can pay with uh, with mobile money and other digital uh, payment instruments. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that you save a lot of money that you would otherwise lose in uh, in administrative work, uh, in fraud, 
and in general administering uh, your money. Um, so, so that's what Sente does in a nutshell. Uh, so some of our customers uh, that you might know include um, the likes of Jumia, MCOPA, and ULP. Um, and so we are, especially during this pandemic when people at home, uh, you can basically do, um, I don't know how to say it, you can manage your company money uh, wherever you are at home. And you mentioned something earlier that this should be for the youth. I'm just at the borderline of youth, so, <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here. I could, I could, I could not resist. I could. I keep calling myself a youth until uh, one of my colleagues uh, said, "Actually, Dennis, just look at your bald head." Uh, and as uh, you can see, uh, but this is genetic, much more than anything else. Now, Alan, you have uh, helped me understand. You've, uh, I know that you've pivoted. Uh, you used to be in a B two C space, and now you are in a B two B space. Am I right? And if so, please could you uh, help to? maybe for the benefit of our, of, our, of our participants. What is the difference between these two? And if someone is getting into the ICT space, uh, what are the advantages mm. of being in one and the disadvantages of being in another? Mm. Okay, so I will give the analogy of, of a bank. Uh, it's like when you go to the bank, you can open up a personal account. So before we were trying to open up or to build a platform where people could open up personal digital accounts that they could use for their everyday payments and expenses. Uh, what we did is that we, we say, no, let's focus only on business accounts. Um, so if you know a bank called um, Citibank, uh, it focuses 100% on, 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 on mid-level businesses and, and corporate businesses. So that's the way we're positioning ourselves uh, as a digital bank uh, or as not a digital bank, bank that is a very dangerous one, as a digital account or mid-level and enterprise businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're all big markets, so I, I wouldn't say there is a, uh, but they're all very big markets and all have very big opportunities to go into. The, the reason I'm asking that question is, in innovation, it's uh, your go-to-market strategy is really very important, uh, and maybe for the benefit yes. of uh, this is this is unfortunate when you're facilitating such sessions when you uh, uh, done sessions on innovation. Your go-to-market strategy mm -hmm. is really very important. You might have an idea, but how are you going to go to the market? And one of the things that you need mm -hmm. to be very clear about is customer segments. So everyone out there needs a digital account, but who is it? Is it the women? Is it the youth? Is it the students? Is it the businesses? Uh, so having mm. a very clear market segmentation of your product is actually a very important part of uh, the journey that these uh, young people really should be on. And of course, once you've done that, then your strategy to engage these markets is, 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 is going to be very different. What have you found uh, uh, in trying to engage on these two different strategies as you pivoted? Have you found that maybe the business to business when you're a business dealing with just businesses, that maybe it's a much easier uh, focus on mm. maybe in terms of uh, potentially revenue from that side, or as opposed to dealing mm. with uh, a business that's dealing with consumers, because the strategy with most digital platforms, uh, the strategy, and you'll have seen most of these startups burn a lot of money just to get as many people on the platform as possible before you actually start making money out of them. Uh, and that mm. tends to be very hard to get the people to join the platform. That tends to burn a lot of money before you actually make any money out of these individuals. The dropout rates usually are very high. Uh, so what has been your experience trying to play in these two different markets and what kind of experiences can you share? Or advice would you give some of the participants who are contemplating which direction to take? Okay. Uh, so thank you, Dennis, for that question. Uh, so in terms, go-to-market strategy is very, very important. Uh, you need to understand your market very, very well. Uh, so before, when we were going after the consumer market, uh, we really took an approach of heavy marketing, heavy branding, and heavy discounts, because that's what consumers care about. They make decisions very, very quickly, uh, usually on your brand recognition and your pricing and the deals that you're getting them. Uh, what we found out, though, is that that is very, very capital intensive 
And the companies that succeed in that space need to raise a lot of capital. I'm sure you guys have heard of a company called Chipakash. If you haven't heard, check it out. Uh, Ugandan founded guy. Uh, they've raised $170 million. Uh, so yep. that's the type of capital that you need to raise to win in the consumer space. Uh, it is very marketing heavy, discount heavy, in order for you to get uh, venture, venture level scale. Uh, B, B2B is more sales driven. Uh, so you, you target a customer, you walk there, you find out what their problem is. So for example, if we're targeting uh, UNDP, uh, we would ask Banner to introduce us to their finance team, find out what challenges they are having. And if we found out that they are having, uh, they're using checks or cash and having uh, issues with accountability, uh, people are you know, forging receipts from NASA Road, they would be a perfect candidate for our product. So we would sell them the benefits of that and, and, and move on from there. I hope that answers your, your question. Yeah, but there is a, an interesting question here by uh, Bridget Tusinza, who is saying, why did Mr. Allen make the people from B to C to B to B? Couldn't he keep both? But that's, that's a good question. I think it's a matter of, of focus. Uh, as, a, as a company, as a startup, what you have in limited, what you have, which is very limited, is resources. And your resources are time and money. So you need to think needle, right? You know, needle has, a, it might be very tiny, but it has a very big impact. So rather than think, uh, what, what has white best? So rather than be white, think sharp. So I would advise every uh, person who thinks about an idea in this space to think, um, be very, very focused on your customer segment uh, because you will have deeper impact. When you have deeper impact, then you can start to spread wide, but don't start wide at the very beginning. Uh, you have limited time and money to do that. That's a very key uh, issue that is going to be covered in the masterclass sessions, which are beginning on the 2nd of August. Uh, and around the business uh, model canvas is a whole section on your customer segments. That's really very important, especially if you're dealing with a technology-based product, your product can't serve everyone. Even the likes of uh, Facebook, and you'll see this in digital platforms, social digital platforms. Some of us are on Facebook because maybe our age speaks to that. There is a particular category that lives on LinkedIn. Uh, there's a younger, my sister is Zora is uh, on Instagram. Perhaps most of our uh, nice kind of uh, community lives on uh, on Instagram. My daughter, on the other hand, uh, is on TikTok, uh, which actually used to be um, uh, musically. She was on on it when it was still musically. Can you imagine? So this was was an app for like 10, 15, 12 year old kids playing about it, and now it has grown. So if you went into the social media space. Uh, Customer segmentation is very important and digital platforms, different digital platforms speak to different um, audiences. Maybe on that note, allow me to bring in uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick Mugi. Uh, Mugi, you are an expert in, uh, in this space in terms of uh, not just uh, intellectual property, but some of the stuff that we're talking about, which is about the technology that is behind. I think uh, Phyllis started off by helping us to to, 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 to distinguish between software and hardware. And I wonder what kind of uh, distinction you're able to make uh, from an intellectual property point of view. Do you see, for instance, more registrations on the software side? Do you see more registrations on the hardware side? Um, are you able to distinguish the two from an academic perspective? What I've seen is from my experience, I have, try to help a business to register their software as intellectual property. My goodness, what a process. What a long, lengthy process. I didn't realize, but it's such a lengthy process. Can you please help us to go through the process that someone would need to, to register the intellectual property within their software? Let's start with software first and foremost. What kind of intellectual property would need to be secured and what is the process like? Uh, uh, thank you, Dennis. And uh, thank you, my colleagues, uh, uh, the panelists. 
and also the 163 participants um, in this uh, session. They have already been introduced. Uh, I'm a commissioner in charge of innovations and intellectual property management at the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. I'm also an innovator, a researcher, and an entrepreneur uh, because I realized for Ugandans, uh, I found it over the years, it's very hard to, to be so theoretical for Ugandans. <laughs> they, want, uh, uh, they want to see things move and as well, they are so practical. So when you talk about uh, innovation and also you're not one, to them, they think, I don't think you, are, you have enough empathy to understand what you go through as innovators. So this should actually be able to give you that comfort that uh, I have gone through this process of uh, 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 acquisition of uh, IP rights. So basically, and I know what the kind of pain and gains that are, uh, are involved in the entire process. Maybe uh, going to uh, the question that uh, uh, the moderator has posed. Maybe, maybe, and, maybe, maybe. If I can, if I can rephrase it slightly, um, I know that there's about five different types of intellectual property, That's right. and that each of those covers different things. Maybe it might be better to, to set the scene, and then yeah. we'll see where the typical ICT ones actually fall into. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so basically, um, I think uh, just to begin with, uh, what is intellectual property in a nutshell? Is uh, I would wish each one of you to. Uh, if you can, to look at the shape and size of your head. Uh, to me, because uh, I've put on a video, uh, you can see, I think, I don't I think my head is oval, but I think I'd be happy if participants also used the chart to, to describe the shapes and sizes of their heads. It's what would you make of mine? Well, I, I, I think yours could be egg-shaped. It's much closer. To mine, you know, when uh, in school they used to call me head boy, not because I was a head boy, but uh, they said that I had a big head. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if I have other colleagues on the in, in this uh, engagement if they were called uh, they were nicknamed those kind of names. But why am I asking this? It's because it doesn't really matter the shape of your head or the size of your head. It's the output in what that particular head is able to process and to bring a good to the society or the community. So what is IP or intellectual property? In simplicity, this is just the tangible output that human uh, uh, creativity and ingenuity can present to, to the society. You think of a, a very nice story, you decide to put your thoughts in writing, you decide after you put your thoughts into writing, you want to come up with a novel. And of course, now that is a piece of uh, literally work, which you can actually get the kind of IP that you refer to as copyright. As we speak now, all the participants, I believe if you've got a notebook and a pen, each one of you has already, by the time we end this session, would have already acquired a form of IP and that is copyright. Because whatever every panelist has put in perspective, you have captured and interpreted it in your own way. So which is unique from uh, if the participant, I had someone called Kakai from Kavale, I had another person from Aleptong. I think all of you are going to capture these thoughts in a very different way. And if I was to look at your notes, you realize each one of you has got a unique way that they have presented this, that is copyright. So ready, all of you are going to acquire copyright by the time we finish this session. But then we look at uh, other aspects of intellectual property that might be very key and critical in this session. And as well in this ideathon process, we are looking over um, a section of intellectual property which is referred to as industrial property. Why is it called industrial property? Its origin was essentially intended to be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to protect uh, works of industry and especially during the industrial revolution age. And uh, so when you talk of IP, IP is the concept of intellectual property and its application. It's very old, it dates back in the 
18th century. So basically there's a lot that has happened over the years and intellectual property has grown to where it is today. And uh, so under industrial property, we've got the likes of patents, a very common term that you may be very familiar with. It has been uh, very common in the news of recent, especially because of the COVID X <laughs> and, um, and uh, its inventor. We've also been talking about Covilice, the one from Gulu University. If you've been watching the news, you should have come into contact with this kind of terms. So what do patents protect essentially? Patents will only protect something that is new, something that is inventive, and something capable of industrial application. So the question is, you come up with, um, uh, for example, let's say M-Scan. M-Scan could be an app maybe, for example, but maybe they could have formed or invented a, 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 a device, an electronic device, which is supposed to be used to actually do the actual scans. So that is potentially could be patented. And uh, we are looking at uh, uh, other aspects of uh, industrial designs. I will go back again to the, the M-Scan if they decided to make a device. Now, industrial design, we are looking at your outlook. How do you appear, your appearance, the aesthetic value? That is basically what industrial designs are going to protect. If you take a look at your phones right now, they are of different designs, different manufacturers, uh, the likes of Samsung, Apple, the likes of um, a, a, a Nokia or Techno. All those are phones, but the designs are different. So majority of the firms or private sector players really take advantage when it comes to industrial designs because this is what appeals to the customer to buy their brand. So those are industrial designs. And industrial designs, they, they don't protect the functionality. So it's only, I look at this design, I've liked it, I buy it. Whether it works for me, if it doesn't work, that's none of your problem. You bought it because you liked it. It was appealing to you. Then you've got what you call utility models. Utility models are as good as patents, only that uh, we do refer to them as uh, lesser patents or petty patents. So you'll still require for that particular uh, invention to be new, but the aspect of uh, inventiveness, it's usually not so much considered because uh, we are looking at uh, this could be aspects of uh, incremental innovations into existing in innovations and in that particular respect. And uh, maybe at this point, it would be very good for me to differentiate between the two terms. At times, people in the innovation space have used them synonymously, but that is not correct. So what is an invention and what is an innovation? An invention essentially is getting, creating something new into existence. Something new into existence, you've invented. The person who came up with a biro pen, this uh, biro pen, Actually, you call it Byropen, but actually the inventor was called Byron. Uh, so don't think that maybe it just came from the blues. Look at the safety pin. A very simple kind of uh, object, but someone got a patent for that. So invention, you're actually creating something new into existence, into being. The way God created man, created Adam and Eve, created you. It was something new that came into existence. But what happens when you innovate? When you innovate, you bring something new that has never existed before into use. So here we mean that you've actually now translated that invention, you've attached the aspect of, um, aspect of uh, a commercial value onto it, and it's now in the market. It's now actually serving the intended use to the targeted market. Now, you can have, the, this world has got so many inventions, but very few innovations. I hope that is very clear, such that you do not confuse this along the way, even in your ideation process. That's why even as we go ahead to vet and look at the, where is the IP in these ideas? We'll find there are so many inventions, potential inventions, but you might actually find that not many will make it to the market and therefore there will never be 
innovations. Let us go to trademarks. Trademarks essentially is for you to let people know who you are. For example, you're in the, in the STEM ICT space. Uh, let's say, for example, the likes of uh, my two brothers here, uh, Alan and, uh, and, uh, and Solomon. If you look at the ideas or solutions they're providing to the market, they're very close in terms of applicability in commerce. But what differentiates Alan's product to Solomon's product? By using trademarks, either logos, symbols, or words, or combination of the two, they are able to differentiate the, the, the service that Solomon offers to the service that Alan offers. Those are trademarks. Trademarks have gone even as far as protecting scents. That's why if you are using Calvin Klein as a perfume or deodorant, sometimes those guys have actually protected the scents. So by just a mere uh, uh, getting into contact with the scent of, let's say maybe Giorgio Armani, you'll be able to know that, did no, this scent is actually for this guy. What makes that difference? People protected those as trademark. Sounds. When you, hear, when you hear MTN saying, MTN everywhere you go, Airtel says that uh, the smartphone network, the day MTN decides to use that tagline of the smartphone network, Airtel can sue them. The day Airtel decides to use the term Airtel everywhere you go, MTN can institute a litigation against them. So those are the differences. Renzori mineral water is very different from uh, uh, Highlands mineral water or Vero. They're all water, mineral water brands, but what differentiates them could be the packaging, which can also protect industrial designs, be protected by industrial designs, and also the trademark, which are symbols or logos. Then we could also potentially go to topographics or uh, in, uh, integrated uh, circuit layouts. STEM and ICT, you do a lot of uh, uh, these topographics, especially for electrical devices. An ICT, an integrated circuit for a smartphone, I mean for a phone, is very different to that of a flat iron or a percolator. It's uniquely placed and therefore you can actually get protection in terms of uh, 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 IP protection when you come up with uh, an integrated circuit for an electronic device. That is a know-how that you can actually seek IP for. So those who are into making devices, gadgets, just know the electronic component that you're able to make this work, that integrated layer circuit you can actually protect it, it's protected. Then finally, all these particular forms of intellectual property, majority of them you need to disclose for you to get this kind of uh, protection in return. Remember an intellectual property system has three major stakeholders. You've got the inventor or creator, you or me, who comes up with this new invention or this new piece of work. Then you've got the state that confers upon you those exclusive rights that are a temporary monopoly to allow you to only do this work on your own. It belongs to you. No one else can decide to manufacture this product without your permission. No one can decide to use this process that you've patented without your permission. No one can even import or even export this kind of products made from your invention without your permission. Then you've got the society or the community. If you have been following closely uh, the drama that has been unfolding regarding COVID, at one point, the institution where the inventor has been working says, no, we need to sit down and discuss the actual ownership issues 
of this COVID X. Then politicians come up and say, no, this gentleman cannot claim ownership of this intellectual property, yet he was funded using the taxpayer's money. Society comes in, society presents itself. But of course, to cut the long story short, there's a lot of facts that are not being said. So basically, just know the three components define what an, a functional intellectual property system could be in any jurisdiction. And another thing, last but not least, for you to understand is that um, intellectual property are territorial in nature. When you protect, your, th that means that actually we've got nothing like global protection of IP. So you cannot say that once Uganda Registration Services Bureau, which hosts the National IP Office, grants you a patent for a mechanical device, yeah? You cannot receive that protection. It doesn't cover global protection. That means that you'll only receive protection within Uganda. If you are interested in extending your protection to Kenya, you have to go to Kenya and file protection for that mechanical device in Kenya and be granted that particular protection. So, but there are mechanisms of doing that in multiple countries. And the last form of IP that I want you to really take seriously, which more often than not at this point uh, as uh, uh, participants in the idea thorn in the different themes, are trade secrets. All of us here have got secrets. All of you participants, I'm sure you've got individual secrets. The question is this, a secret you don't disclose because it is a secret. But in commerce or intellectual property space, when we talk of trade secrets, this is technical or business related information that is quite useful, has got potential value, not very common uh, in terms of application in the sphere in which uh, a, a particular person who owns it operates in. And uh, it's something that, of course, you can own it for the rest of your life. You don't disclose it and you don't register it. And in Uganda, we've got, uh, we've got a law or legal framework uh, that actually protects not you having a trade secret, but misappropriation of trade secrets. When I talk of misappropriation, I mean, today I have, um, uh, I've been employed by Dennis and uh, um, uh, 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 my sister, uh, Banam Jema, she owns a competing um, entity and she comes and solicits for me and says, you know, Mugi, I'm going to pay you all the money that you want as long as you get me the production manual for Dennis's company. Now that is industrial espionage. Now the law will protect that. Or if I come and I say that, uh, you've, uh, and in this case, I could come to Dennis's company and then Dennis has already put that uh, kind of like a, 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 a notice that no cameras allowed in this farm. But to me, I hide my phone in my socks and I reach while they're doing the actual production, I begin taking photos. That is illegal. Dennis can sue me because those photos, I could potentially be taking them to a competitor. And of course, I would have disclosed or misappropriated useful information that Dennis wanted to keep secretive because it has got commercial value. So a good example is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola could have chosen, Coca-Cola began in 1896 in Atlanta, Georgia, and they would have decided to actually use go the patent route for their formulation. So from 1896, add 20 years, you can calculate that. That would have actually expired by now. 
Remember, patents are also time bound. 20 years, it goes into the public domain. So you can no longer protect it and say that, ah, this is mine. You cannot even sue your competitor for using that technology. Because remember, 20 years, that is enough monopoly for you really to do whatever you wanted to do. And so, but for Coca-Cola, I decided, no, we are going to keep our formulation as a trade secret. A hundred years down the road, Coca-Cola remains one of the most competitive brands in, soft, in the soft drinks and the beverage industry globally. I mean, who doesn't know Coca-Cola? Even your grandmother in the village, you ask her, grandma, can I give you a soda? She tell you, give me Coca-Cola. Uh-huh. So basically that explains to you how these things really get a, a quick one. A quick one, Mugi. When, when is the Coca-Cola secret expiring so we can start making some here in Uganda? Ourselves, Not, like ordinary Ugandans. And apparently, uh, it cannot expire. It will only expire when it comes into someone discloses it to the public. So the likes of Pepsi, the likes of now Reham Cola, they're all trying to get closer to that. But ideally, that test that you normally get, the refreshing test that you normally take, I feel in that Coca-Cola when it's fizzy, chilly in the hot sun, like right now, that refreshing test, it's still a trade secret. And something surprising, by the way, this could actually interest all of you that have all the guys that know aspects of um, how the Coca-Cola has managed to manage that their trade secrets is that some of the information is kept in a vault, somewhere in a vault. So you cannot, you can only access it if you're authorized to access. And the technical people that know partly some of the, or part of the formulation, they do not know each other. And they will never know each other. So these guys are paid so highly. So even if they uh, one person will only know a chunk of the secret, another one a chunk of the secret. They will never have the full uh, kind of like a, a formulation uh, to their knowledge. So basically, so, that, uh, and especially now, maybe uh, uh, another thing that uh, you may need to know is that uh, the only setback with trade secret, reverse engineering is allowed. Now, this is important for the same ICT space. Reverse engineering is allowed because as long as you did not acquire this information regarding the product you want to engineer unlawfully, if I picked a, a, a beverage from uh, the shelf and I went and walked backwards to understand the recipes in that particular product, and I actually came up with a carbon copy of that particular product. The, the owner of the original product cannot sue me. Why? For one, it's not protected. It's just there on the shelf. It has been, he has decided to go the trade secret route for non-disclosure. Me, I've decided because I'm an expert in the game as well, I've decided to do what? To pick this product and reverse engineer and now I've brought a similar product, but branded it differently in the market space. So reverse engineering, of course it takes a lot of intuition and know-how for you to reverse engineer someone's product. It's either you've got the so, know-how. So basically that also explains the basics of intellectual property. Now, let me go to this space of um, what you've, uh, uh, the, the, the issues of uh, software. Now, softwares in this country Globally, they can be protected either via patents or via copyright. Now in Uganda, software is not protected via patents. It's not. So actually when we look at um, uh, in what we call the, um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the patent laws, there's what we call the patentable subject matter and non-patentable subject matter. So the patentable subject matter in this space, for example, is that which would follow under, it has been well articulated by the different laws. Because now, for example, a product can be protected. Um, a process 
can be patented, a formulation can be protected, new chemical entity can be protected, a medical device can be protected. So what cannot be protected, I think is uh, what you need to do. So basically under patent laws, computer programs are never protected under patents. And also uh, looking at um, uh, uh, methods of uh, conducting uh, um, uh, um, uh, medical operations, mainly for humans and even animals, are also not, uh, you cannot protect them. Like I'll give you an example. Right now, I believe you've actually been, uh, all of you must have been tested uh, 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 for COVID. And partly what they do is that uh, checking your temperature using the handgun, they place it like this to take your temperature, right? Now, if someone decides to patent that process of holding a temperature gun and showing it on your forehead, really it will be unethical. However, the gun, can be patented because it's a, a, a technology. It can be patented, but or in the past, the way they used to take your temperature, they get the, the, the thermometer, they put it under your, under your armpits. If someone decided to patent that process, it would be unethical. Now, again, even actually business methods are also not protected under patents. So softwares are also not, but however, there are moments when softwares, and this has been an issue, especially even within the uh, European Union and the EPO, that is the European Patent Office. What has been happening is that they, can, they have decided that a software can be patented if it actually depicts a technical character. So technical character in this case is that what contribution in terms of technical character uh, or like maybe the, the technical aspect, if it has been either been incorporated into a device, to what degree does it contribute to the technical aspect of that particular invention? So what normally happens in Uganda today is that when you've got a software or a computer program, you've, the only option you have is copyright. And in copyright, what they ask is that basically you define or describe what this software does. However, my advice would be to you, uh, the participants, and also maybe even some of the uh, panelists who are into this space, is that I would urge you to, yes, as you describe this, how your software works, at times I might ask you to disclose the soft code, I mean the source code. Do not disclose that. You can keep that as a know-how. Because as, as soon as you, you're able to talk about the source code, then I think anyone, I mean, that's the algorithm that uh, uh, defines, it's the center of your solution. So you describe how this works. That's a literally piece of work and get a copyright for it. But the actual algorithm or the source code, keep it as a know-how, keep it as a trade secret. And now, however, now. This, yes. I, I, I was going to say, uh, I, I've known Mugi long enough to know that his passion for intellectual property. If I don't stop him, we'll be here, we'll be here all day. Uh, but I deliberately let you go on long enough because I know that this is a key part of this yeah. idea. And especially within the ICT space, that's where most of the questions actually have been coming from in terms of intellectual mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. And now that we know that there are two key routes, the hardware mm -hmm. and the software, my understanding mm -hmm. at this stage is that it's probably easier to patent the hardware bits, but the ones yes. that might be a bit more sophisticated are the software. Yes. So I'll come back to you on that one in terms yes. of how we plan to go uh, about, because yeah. you're supporting us as well yeah. in terms of how we go about the intellectual property. I'll come back to you on that one. One of okay. the things that you talked about very briefly was, uh, uh, and maybe this is an interesting question that I might put to perhaps uh, Bana. It's, uh, it's about the trends. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was Nokia. You know, I had, had the word Nokia crossing out uh, from your lips. But we know, of course, that uh, the likes of Nokia, the likes of BlackBerry, the likes of Kodak, uh, these were huge giants in, uh, in the ICT technology space, but they are long gone. Uh, so, Bana, if I might bring you on board, uh, one of the things you 
did uh, you have worked over the years has been about moving from us from 2G uh, to 4G. Uh, I know that some countries like now in the UK, we're talking 5G and we're talking about things like the internet of things. Uh, Bana, could you uh, care to, uh, maybe for the benefit of our listeners, share some thoughts on what that journey is. What is 2G? What is 3G? What's 4G? What's 5G? Where are we on, on, on that path? And what kind of trends are you seeing? And maybe for the young people who are planning to launch some new products and services, is this information of any use to them? Bana? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dennis, and to all our panelists. I was very, uh, I was still listening to Mugi, still dazzled by all uh, the information he was <laughs> dishing out. And yes. uh, as uh, if I was an, an innovator and entrepreneur sitting in that space, I probably wouldn't have wanted him to stop. So thank you very much to, uh, to Mugi. That information that you have given out is quite, quite, quite important for our attendees today. Um, so 2G, 3G, 4G, all those are just basically access technologies and uh, within, uh, within the internet, um, especially within the mobile technology uh, setting. I did work in the telecommunications sector, specifically the data uh, sector for a very uh, 10 years, for a long time. And we did start with, before you were just sending an SMS, that was your methodology of sending uh, some form of text over your phone to, to your loved one or to somebody that you needed to uh, send out some information to. And then we moved to, uh, we moved of course to the 2G, 3G, 4G technologies and now uh, 5G. What these access technologies help us with especially for the innovation innovators in this space is that they give us a platform to create and to create in a space where you have a, a, a technology platform actually available for you. So if you have, for, and these also represent uh, the speeds of internet on your mobile device. So 2G was a little slower, 3G a bit better, 4G, 5G, and, and now you're talking about internet of things and having everything connected. You can talk to your fridge from your phone. You can speak to your washing machine while you're away. You can lock your house and etc. Um, we haven't exactly reached that, that space in, uh, in Uganda, but we have reached a space where we can have uh, 4G technologies. Without a doubt, uh, for the past two years, I'm sure everybody has found themselves in a space where they're appreciating the internet at this point in time. Look at um, this journey that we have walked together with you, Nace, from last year, where we're trying to formulate how do we run decisions to inspire the youth, to inspire these young people. But we had all these limitations and we had to pivot. But since last week, we've been seeing numbers of 200 people, 150 in each of these sessions. And this is thanks to some of these technologies. You're able to go into your laptop, you're able to go into your phone, and you're able to log in. And, and you get all the knowledge that you hunger from, from these sessions. So basically, uh, basically these uh, technologies really give us a platform to help us to connect, to connect not just with uh, within Uganda, but also out of Uganda. And for an innovator and a, and a person uh, in this space, it allows you to work even um, with all the other people. You don't have now to walk into an office right now. I can, I've, I've worked with Dennis and probably I've seen him or had an in-person meeting with him once. And, or uh, let's say some of my colleagues I haven't seen uh, since March or something like that. So. Uh, these technologies are here for us. They're here to help us. They're here to help uh, all our entrepreneurs provide for them a platform in which to connect. They're here to help them also compare their products and, and services to what is being developed around the world. Because also you need to see that you're, des you're designing and developing a quality product that can be compared on a, a platform bigger than our Ugandan space. Without Perhaps. a doubt, yes. yes so, 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 but I, I, was, I was going to say, one of the things I, uh, so my sister is into, uh, she's a data analyst. She's into ICT. She, she basically crunches numbers for a living and she has a very good job in London. Um, but I know her story, how she ended up there. She was always geeky at home. We used to 
make funny faces of, about her, like she's a tomboy, blah, 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 blah. So how has a beautiful lady like you ended up in ICT or is it, uh, is it that uh, that is the misconception that ICT is for geeks and things like, uh, uh, you know, that we must have like dreadlocks for the ICT people as well as the creative ones. Uh, how, how, how can you, uh, could you, do you mind sharing your story as, as, as a lady in this space? How actually you ended up there? Maybe Phyllis might also have some thoughts on how that, because we, we, we see, uh, and one of the things about technology and innovation is this idea of empathy. And we know that uh, females are more empathetic. And if you're designing some software that is not, uh, that is just about the technology and not necessarily the, in, the end user or the person, you're likely to have issues. So there is a huge cry to have more ladies within the ICT and STEM space. Do you mind sharing your thoughts, how you ended up in this space and some inspiration for our participants? All right, thank you, Dennis. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it stems from interest. I come from, you said just how you have a sister. I come from a family of five girls and we're all in the engineering space. Uh, one is a civil engineer, two electrical engineers. And, and so, I would say it starts from uh, it started from where I come from from my home, and that's where the interest uh, built. But also, without a doubt, this is a space where you travel, and it's sometimes a lonely journey for us uh, ladies, because you uh, like I found myself in an electrical engineering class where we are twelve girls out of about seventy people, and and so it is. Uh, it could be quite challenging, but also without a doubt, you need a, a very big support system. So the support system that I had back then from home and also from my teachers, my school, uh, my school was a very, very, very big breeding ground for uh, building interest in this space. And also the hunger for knowledge the hunger for knowledge in this space and to know that it's not necessarily, I, I recently shared, I think in one of our funny chats that we like to say, everybody, when, when you say uh, your daughter is going to do electrical engineering, uh, I, I remember oh, our grandparents would say, oh my God, she's going to climb um, <laughs> electrical poles. And that was like a huge abomination <laughs> for them. But as we go along this journey, all these uh, theories and all these thought processes are constantly being demystified. I mean, IT is being opened, has been opened up and we see so many ladies in there, computer science. Uh, even in the electrical engineering classes, I am sure there are quite a number of uh, ladies if we draw the trajectory that have, uh, that have joined these classes uh, of, af right after the rest of us did. Uh, it's quite a challenging journey, of course. And um, it really helps that sometimes the environment allows you to do that and allows you to work in this space. I like to say that sometimes it doesn't as well because uh, I spent 10 years in the telecommunication sector and for the 10 years we were two girls, two ladies in the entire section, two ladies out of so many gentlemen. But I understood why, because sometimes this work can be can be very difficult, especially as you transition, because you'll walk in as a young lady, you'll walk in uh, five years later, maybe you've gotten married, you're having children, and then you have to sit in this space, work sometimes crazy hours, and then you have it becomes a bit complicated. But as long as you have the right amount of um, support system and your environment allows you to grow and thrive, then uh, without a doubt, the space is open for ladies. And I'm very passionate about empowering them, empowering young ladies to join the STEM field because there is a lot of tacit knowledge that sits with these ladies, but they're always afraid. And the environment builds us in such, sometimes the environment structures us in such a way that it doesn't allow you to grow and thrive because uh, it gives you this notion that that environment is not right for you or it's too difficult. But I mean, we've seen, civil engineers standing on the roads, ladies, and they stand there the whole day and they're contributing quite a big, um, a big aspect to, um, to this space. So if you have your interest there, if you have your knowledge there, ensure that you do it, that you, you take it upon yourself to be there. Also, uh, the presence of mentors in this space has been quite a big, a big propelling factor. When you look at some of these ladies who are now, let's say, head of the, the engineering board or something like that, it's quite an inspirational uh, thing for you to be able to, 
uh, to join and, and thrive in this space because you'll, and you'll know that it is actually possible. It's not, it's not something that is without uh, reach. And I, I'm very happy uh, to see that there are quite a number of lady entrepreneurs right now but we have to continue encouraging them. Uh, Dennis, without a doubt, I know a lot of people fear to join this space, but they have the knowledge, they have, the cap they have all the capabilities that are needed. And in Uganda, I know we have so many women entrepreneurs. If you look around, you'll find that a lot of them are trying to, uh, to design, to thrive in this space, but it's just that sometimes our, even our cultural norms, like I said, when I, when I walked into the electrical engineering class, my grandparents thought I was going to be climbing electrical poles. And I had to, you have to educate them that, you know, there is quite a vast range of things you can do in electrical out, engineering. Out, out of curiosity, out of, have you actually ever climbed uh, electrical? <laughs> no, 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 but I have, uh, I have done quite an array of things within because once you, you drain, uh, you have to do a lot of work around uh, civil, mechanical, electrical. So I've cleaned a car engine, I've, I've designed window hinges, I've done some quite, some quite, some of those. And as you do that, you find yourself in a place where you find, where you, uh, you pick your interest. And really my interest was more in the telecommunication side, the lighter current side of things, and eventually the innovation space where we continuously design products and services that are more relevant and that are, uh, that are very critical for to deliver services that are needed by the people today and that uh, are for the people. Yeah. One, of, one of the things I found uh, interesting, and it's, in, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a key part of uh, I've noticed this as part of the UNDP, you're really a passionate bunch uh, in terms of supporting uh, uh, young women, uh, all the way from uh, Madame Elsie at Apo, you can tell her passion is, is, is there. Uh, the Accelerator Lab itself, the whole team is almost female. I mean, yourself, uh, Hatija, and Deborah, who has uh, since left. Um, is, it, is it deliberate? Is it a coincidence that uh, the brightest minds in around innovation are in the accelerator lab team and they're all female and it, it, it's not a coincidence but i like to say that it was a brilliant coincidence because each and every part of uh, each and every one of the ladies that are part of this team bring a vast range of knowledge to the table and uh, of course without a doubt just looking at the statistics themselves as you explained to us uh, how the applications have gone there's really a as there is really a void in this space that we need to close. We need to make sure that some of these ladies are brought on board, that they are encouraged, that they they are brought, that their their knowledge is also being a big contributing factor to the development of this country. And that's why we are very very passionate about them. A lot of these ladies contribute a lot, but they always get bogged down and 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 they're never acknowledged. Yeah. For me, I'd like to give simple examples in the innovation space. Think about the lady around, around your home who has this small, what we call mudala. A lot of those ladies fed their families. By that simple innovation of thinking, let me do, sell a little tomatoes right next to the neighborhood where if Dennis, whose weekly shopping has run out, let's say on a Thursday, he's able to walk to that space and, and do that. And a lot of these ladies fed their families throughout this pandemic that simple innovation of thinking, let me serve the customer right outside their door. But that person is never acknowledged. They'll probably think about the husband who writes the border border and he's never has stopped working. And so he's vulnerable and all these things. Yes, so yes. it's very, very, very critical that we also bring on board this space, uh, these ladies on um, here. and. We are educating our girl child. We keep on saying that we want to educate them, we want to empower them, but we can't just leave them hanging after they have finished all this education. We have to empower them to prop and propel them to be even the, the very best versions of themselves. And so we are very, very critical about this in the uh, UNDP and making sure that there is equal opportunity for everyone. Without a doubt, the boy child is not forgotten, that the gentlemen are not forgotten. We think about them, we are always on, uh, they're always trying to um, also make sure that they are, they are on the table, but we want to see that this now, if we are having a, a, a youth idea phone like this and the applications are coming in, let's have at least 50, 45, not 75, 25, that doesn't, 
that doesn't yeah. make sense. We have a long way to go. That is something that we are going to be aggressive in terms of focusing on uh, when we do the next round of the Ideathon. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I've seen a lot of academic research and data suggesting that uh, women are more entrepreneurial and yet with the Ideathon, something has happened. I'm not very sure what that is. Uh, but now that I have you, uh, can you very quickly talk about the UNDP's Accelerator Lab uh, and the kind of work that you're doing around the um, youth for business? Uh, I know I've mentioned at the beginning that uh, the UNDP has been, and maybe credit where it is due uh, with this lockdown in, the, in this pandemic, the UNDP has been showing leadership with uh, supporting businesses, supporting startups, supporting MSMEs, uh, to not just innovate or create, but to find a way in which they are doing things differently. I've known uh, your partnership with Jumia that has been very helpful in terms of bringing that leader that you were talking about who has the modala, who is in the market somewhere, to bring their nyanya to my place here, for instance. We tried this Jumia thing, actually, uh, was it, uh, last week. My wife did shopping via that. It was amazing. The, the products arrived uh, fresh, you know, who would have thought? So um, do you want to talk more briefly about uh, what the UNDP is doing in terms of supporting startups and SMEs? Uh, what grants are available? I know that there is another call going out around the creatives, even though we have a creatives, track as part of the youth idea zone there is another one which is slightly much bigger maybe just if you do 10 minutes to, to talk about all the programs that you have not just under the accelerator lab but the youthful business in, in in particular okay uh, thank you very much dennis there, there's quite a, a vast array of things that uh, we are doing in the undp but uh, if I could just touch a little bit about what the Accelerator Lab is doing. Now, the Accelerator Lab is, uh, was birthed out of the humility that in the development space, we sometimes miss, um, we sometimes miss certain things in terms of impact in, uh, with our programming. Because as anyone would appreciate sometimes um, in the public sector, we design programs, let's say for four or five years, and then uh, we have 21st development challenges moving at an exponential rate. So this linear method of working will definitely create an impact gap. And so uh, we came up out of that space of humility and, and say we, we actually are moving at a linear pace and these problems are moving faster than us. Case in point is COVID. What we thought was our 2019, if you had programming that started, let's say 2017 and that was supposed to run for five years, 2019 and 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021, it's null and void. You have to pivot and move at a rate that is matching with whatever challenges you're facing right now. So uh, that's how the Accelerator Lab uh, came in came in place. And it's a global learning network with, ni with 91 labs serving 173 countries right now. And so through these labs, we learn about quickly what works and what doesn't. And then we are also our support system to our country office programs to quickly help them understand that what you're doing is not going to achieve the right amount of impact. So we, we help them pivot very quickly and then test something that could easily work and, and uh, hand it over to them. And these tests we run are for a short period of time. We're not going to run something for five, for five years. We're not going to run something for even two years because things are changing at a fast rate. I mean, most of us started 2021 with this high hope that it would be a better year, but instead we've had even a worse second wave. And so we had to change and evolve and quickly do what we, we needed to do in a, different, uh, in a different way. And so this is what uh, the Accelerator Lab does in a nutshell without going to uh, very specifics. The only other thing that I'd like to say is that we also support and elevate grassroots innovations. Mm -hmm. So something like what um, Professor Oguang has done studying a plant for 17 years, because we believe that the knowledge, the knowledge and the insights to solve the problems that people face sit with the people, sit with the people themselves. If you go down to my village where I come from in the mountains, I like to say there is a plant that people plant to avoid mosquito getting malaria and it's planted in they they use it themselves but you see no one has taken time to research around that plant as development programmers as government we say what people are getting sick of malaria let's distribute mosquito nets 
and you find that after 10, after like three months, those mosquito nets are either covers for plants or they are being used for fishing or they're being used for something that is not completely not what you designed it for. But what if you found, what if you change route and sat down with the people in this place and say, how do we do our research on this plant? If it actually does work, encourage people to plant this plant around their home and then help us to solve money. So we believe that the problems and the solutions lie with the people. How do we work with the people to help them solve their own problems? And that's why uh, it's very important to have uh, these grassroots people not forgotten and not left out. Then we have a youth for business portfolio, which is really part of our, our youth programming. It's a grant facility that, uh, that, that is set to help uh, businesses like some of the uh, attendees here today would possibly have. Uh, it targets uh, different sectors and different calls go out for different to call for innovations. We're working together with a stand big uh, incubator that will also give business support to these and entrepreneurship support to uh, these businesses. It's, um, it has run several calls. Uh, the, ch the challenge uh, that we, not the challenge really, but initially it was targeting businesses that had some level of maturity and also businesses that were able to put some of their resources on the ground. And then we work together to, with you so that you don't just expect, a lot of times entrepreneurs will sit down and expect these grants to be given to them. And then whether they have, whether they actually give you value for the money that you have given them or not, you will never know. Sometimes they use the money even for different things. And so that's why we came up with that aspect of having a matching grant. When you put your resources on board, then you'll have some level of ownership of your project. And then we also um, have some incubation support for them with a stand big incubator. This youth idea thorn also came, it came, it was also birthed out of uh, looking at after running several calls and we looked at the type of people who apply for this um, for these calls they are literally the same type of person when you look through um, when you look through the profiles these are people who are a little bit exposed who have gone some distance with their with their project and we realized we're missing out on that person who's just at the idea stage how do we lift them out? That person doesn't even know how to use the computer. That person who doesn't even know how to read and write. I mean, if you've been really keen, uh, just for the uh, panelists and the attendees, to follow how we have, and this all credit goes to NACE and Celeste Media, how we have really, really uh, marketed this youth idea thon was we wanted to reach out to even that lowest person of law who can just pick up the phone and call and say, this is my idea and we fill that form for you and we bring you on board and see how to elevate your idea to the next level. So uh, from the youth idea, from the youth idea form, we hope to fit these ideas into our bigger youth for business portfolio because we acknowledge that in that youth for business program, we were missing out on some of these people. And if really the time had allowed, we were going to go down to the, we're going to have some of these sessions, as uh, Dennis, as you know, down at, uh, you know, we'll go to Gulu, we're going to go to Mbara, we're going to go to Mbali. Yeah. We want to have these sessions down on the ground because we are missing out on some of those people. Some of those people are designing even something as small as a little instrument, let's say in the mining sector to mine a little bit easier than banging with a hammer. Or, so we don't want to miss out on those, um, on those people and we hope that uh, through this process we shall get some of them and even if we miss out on them this will be some we hope that this is will be something that we continuously uh, run and roll and will be an entry point uh, for youth for business uh, projects without a doubt there are so many other calls uh, to for support to innovators that go out we have a creative call we'll have a call around our mining of development uh, sorry SCP development minerals there are quite a number of projects without a doubt that uh, go on and these are all always uh, highly publicized and so we try to support uh, young entrepreneurs within the UNDP to elevate them uh, make sure that their ideas have gone to the next level uh, make sure that they have got some level of support to see that um, 
that that they can move from one space to the other. If today you are selling 10 things, maybe tomorrow you're selling 20 or 30, maybe tomorrow you're inter employing three more people. Uh, we want to see them grow. We want to see them thrive, especially in this time where the white collar job market is shrinking. It is shrinking. It's being replaced by machines. It's being replaced by all these things. We want to make sure that we don't miss out on this opportunity to help all these creative minds uh, all these people who are trying to design and develop new products uh, thrive. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Bana and your your team. I can testify as uh, to the flexibility of the Accelerator Lab, your ability to work with us in a way that has been very helpful. We've been able to pivot quickly, as you can see with the lockdown, uh, apart from maybe Mr. Kavushenga, who is doing something equally interesting, uh, there are not very many things happening around uh, supporting youth and uh, within the space of entrepreneurship, I think uh, working with yourselves has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, one of the other things that you, uh, did, I'll, maybe I'll come back to that one later. Let me just take a look at some of the questions that we are getting. And uh, maybe this is for all our panelists to be on standby, uh, because I'm just going to go and run through them very quickly. If I could ask my panelists, my fellow panelists to, help and rank them up very quickly. We normally do this at, uh, at uh, around uh, 11, but I think we can do it slightly earlier because we've covered quite a number of bases. We now know what uh, the Youth for Business does. We've heard from uh, our panelists around ICT, around FinTech. We've heard a lot about intellectual property. And for the benefit of anyone who is listening in, if you have a question, uh, don't use the chat facility, use the Q&A facility, ask the question, and then my colleagues will rank it up and I'll pick it up as soon as possible. So, Nduhuchi Kenneth is asking, I'm requesting at the end of the session that you take us through the grant management platform so that we're able to well utilize this. That's a very good question. Uh, we probably won't do that now, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a session that is going to be organized on Monday. We will send out the invitation. There will be an email sent out to all the participants. Uh, actually, next week, we're not doing anything in terms of uh, these sessions or the master classes. So the whole of next week is to make sure that uh, everyone has signed up fully on the grant management system, uh, that their ideas have been registered properly. Uh, some people, when they supply their information, they miss out some key bits of information, uh, things like uh, your date of birth or things like that, uh, your, sorry, your, your uh, gender or age. We want to capture all that information because if you do make it to the end, and win this 100 million. We want to make sure that you are who you say you are. And the time for that is now. We need uh, your telephone number because some of the grants are going to be dispersed by mobile money perhaps. Uh, so we need all that information. So there will be an email going out and my colleagues um, who have not, uh, my, my colleagues will be sending an email, but if you have not gone onto the website, please go back to www.undp.nase.co.ug. In the top right corner, there should be a login facilitate, click into that one and log in, and it should give you access to the digital platform in the back end. If you're not able to do so, send an email, info at nase.co.ug. Uh, but next week, the whole focus is really on this platform and making sure that all people are onboarded properly. So by the time we start the thematic sessions, sort of the master classes, we have everyone's details and uh, their ideas are well documented. Next question is from uh, Alan. Kakuku, what does it take to develop a software? Please, because I have a passion in software development. Uh, ah, very good question. Um, I think one of the panelists did mention that he actually thought himself. Uh, so I would suggest you start with YouTube, make some good progress and you'll discover a lot of information. There's actually lots of uh, digital platforms out there, the Udemy's of this world, Khan Dennis. Academy. There's a lot of stuff out there that you could use, uh, tools Dennis. that you can use. Dennis. Yes, please. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but no I've actually, I, I think maybe I've gone ahead of uh, <laughs> the program, but I've uh, responded to most of the questions in the, uh, the Q&A regarding IP. Fantastic. So I think, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, you've yeah. not gone ahead of yourself. You've just done what Boogie does best, which is effective <laughs> responses. Uh, so thank you very much. And I would encourage all the other panelists as well, if there's a question that is specifically directed to you that you could help me and answer it so that we can finish at exactly uh, 11. Um, but of course, as I go through these questions, if any of the panelists want to answer, just chip in like Boogie has done uh, just a while ago. Uh, the next question is from Moses Moses. 
what does it take to learn app development or web designing? I think that's the same thing. Uh, the, the same response I've just given. Um, Basta Davis is saying, in case I have got a brilliant idea, sorry, brilliant software idea, but I don't know coding and therefore I need to hire a software developer. Can we discuss the legal issues with that and how that contract between me and the developer can look like so that I'm protected? That's a very interesting uh, uh, question. Maybe Mugi, you can help answer this or perhaps uh, Aaron Wakatungu. Aaron, I know that you've helped me in the past to identify a web developer. Uh, luckily for me, uh, those individuals were very known to yourself. So we didn't end up having a contract of some sort, but with hindsight, what this gentleman is asking is a very important question. Uh, if you hire someone to develop your content, your, your, your platform, and they run off with it, uh, who owns the intellectual property? Mogi? Yeah, so, so basically this is uh, one area that uh, should actually be well understood. There's what you call a contract, kind of like a best engagement. And, uh, just the fact that a majority of um, uh, web development and maybe uh, software development is a skill. It's a know-how, not a really uh, know that every person who wants to use it could be having it in-house. So most of the time businesses will outsource. But in this, now it goes back to the, um, to the agreements or the contracts that you really design between you, the end user or the one who wants the client and the developer. In most cases, ordinarily, it does make a lot of business sense to really, once I have contracted you, subcontracted you to develop for me a website, in return, you're supposed to actually uh, get back all the content that you've developed. For me, I rightfully am the rightful owner. But, and also the IP that would emerge out of it, you ordinarily, the client should actually be the recipient of it. But if it's just implied, then it does not hold a lot of water. So make it explicit. And you can only do that if at all it's inscribed as one of the clauses in the contract. So make it explicit. And that should be the case. I would give you a case study uh, which actually most of the time we also make um, this kind of mistakes is that you realize, for example, under copyright, the copyright law, he who creates the work owns the copyright ordinarily. Most of you, for example, maybe who are, let's say, have gone through the normal processes of marriage, I know on the day of uh, Kwanjula, Kuhinjira, you always have a photographer who covers the moment. That photographer owns the copyright of actually your function. Every photo he has taken, he owns the copyright for it. I know you've paid because in your, in your budget, you said 2.5 million for the photographer. Yes, it's okay. You paid him for the service but you did not pay him for the IP that accrues from that. So normally what would happen, that's why tomorrow you'd find your photo on red paper, or you find your photo on a billboard. Now you wonder, ah, how did my photo go there? But this guy, maybe he was approached and said, hey, we are looking for hot photos for hot couples, and you are one of them. They give it away for a fee. So what happens is that, also for them, apparently, they could be doing this out of ignorance. By the moment you make them sign and say, you know what, by the way, these particular photos, never use them in any, uh, maybe for any audience without my authorization. And also actually when they can decide to even uh, destroy either maybe uh, these photos or whatever, if it's a, it's a flash, blah, 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 they can actually destroy this. So basically it's an issue of making these things uh, clear, and you bring it on board. So, and I think uh, that should actually explain that, Dennis, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going through some of the questions here. Um, someone is asking, Bana, how we're just to be part of these incubation centers. The Youth Idea Thon is just one of those. Um, how can females, uh, oh, there's a question here from Muchibi Charles. I am an ethics workers. I have passion in ICT but I need guidance in how I can perfect my skills to succeed. 
Same thing I mentioned earlier, there's lots of, uh, not just on YouTube, uh, but there's quite a number of uh, uh, digital platforms out there that you can actually learn how to code. Udemy being one of them, Khan Academy being one of them. There's quite a number uh, of them. Um, their next one is uh, from Gumoshabe Alusias. Uh, good morning. How could you distinguish between ICT and the creative led technology project? Some projects are hard to distinguish. That's a very good question, uh, Gumoshabe. Uh, the, the best way to help you is to begin with an end in mind. I always say that sometimes technology is an enabler. So if the project is, let's say, about games and people playing games, um, the ultimate end is about gaming, playing. That's in the creative space. Mm -hmm. You're being creative. But you're using technology because we could as well play almost to outside, you know? So it doesn't belong in ICT per se. It belongs in the creative space. But I wouldn't worry about which categorization at this stage. I would just say, go ahead and submit your idea. Um, the next question is, Kakai Diana, thank you so much, Pana, for that encouragement. We look forward to taking up the entrepreneurship space. Uh, how best can you help our male counterparts to also change their narrative to what women can do? I think, Bana, uh, Bana you want to respond to this one? Perhaps not just uh, Bana, actually. Uh, both, both, uh, both Bana and uh, Phyllis, if you could please kindly help us. It takes two to tango. What, 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 uh, what uh, the panelist, is, what the participant is saying is that uh, maybe sometimes in a, in a male dominated environment, uh, the male behavior might also need to change. Uh, do you want to respond to that, Bana or Phyllis? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, like I, I could start and then maybe Phyllis would, uh, will add. So, First of all, we need to appreciate that each and everybody brings something to the table. And each and everyone who comes, walks into a room is equally as qualified. So if you find yourself in a space where there, there is a lady or a gentleman, that person has deserved their, 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 their space on the table on which you are on. And so we have to constantly change our minds. You have to constantly even train, like I like to say, even start from training our children to appreciate that whether you're a girl or a boy, you can do all these things. And also to, and also to ask, allow um, our brothers, our fathers, our cousins, our workmates to accept that uh, ladies also bring something to this table. By the time somebody has gone through uh, all, this, all this time of studying, and, and I say it's a lot of time because by the time you come out of an engineering class, you've spent four years in that class, and you've walked into a, a space, you equally deserve to be in that place. And so for the ladies, you have to bring, you have to make sure that your value is felt. That doesn't mean be too loud, be too, too, <laughs> too aggressive, no. Your work will speak for you. You have to make sure that you, you work as diligently, you, work, you do your work as equally as good or even better. And so with, um, as you continuously do your work and, and um, show your value, it will be, you will earn your respect in the spaces in which you are in. I think that is just a little bit of how I can uh, frame an answer to that please, to that. Thank, thank you very much. And, and you're very right. Maybe Phyllis, do you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, to add to what Bana said, actually we had a similar experience um, in my class of radiology, I was actually the only girl <laughs> for a course of four years. And uh, it all came down to behavior. If you are a lady in a male dominated space, do not expect um, everything to be handed to you because you're female. Um, be as assertive as everyone else. You know, we create an environment where um, we lead ourselves to be uh, oppressed or to be um, downcast because if you come in and uh, you start saying, oh, I can't touch this machine because it's too heavy for me, or I can't push this because I'm not supposed to do that, or I'm not supposed to climb uh, electric poles because I'm a woman, you've already created an inferiority complex for yourself. 
And um, there's something called the imposter syndrome um, that so many women suffer with, that uh, maybe you're in an engineering class and because uh, you've been brought up to think that engineering is for males, you, uh, when things get hard, you start to feel like, oh, maybe I'm not supposed to be here because I'm female. We have to teach our girls and our young women that it's okay to fail. Um, there's nothing wrong with failing. Um, I read something interesting on the internet recently that uh, Thomas Edison, the one who made the light bulb, actually failed 1,000 times before he actually had success. So on trial number 1,001, that's when the bulb came to be. So we have to learn that it's okay to fail. Even, even if you're the only female in the place and you failed at something, it's okay. Be, uh, be open to learning and be open to doing better. Be assertive, do not feel sorry for yourself or say, I'm not supposed to do this as a woman, yeah. So I believe it totally comes down to how we handle ourselves in the, in the, work, in the workspace. Thank you very much. Um, and actually that is the, I wouldn't say the, the, the perfect way to answer it because often sometimes even us men, um, you hear people complaining and pushing the problem to the other people saying, why aren't those people changing their attitude, their mindset there? Um, but I, I like the way both of you have gone at it, uh, saying, no, no, take ownership uh, uh, and have pride and, and in what you're doing and trust that your work will speak for itself. Um, next question is from uh, Sekavira Godfrey Waswa. <clears throat> this is a long question, uh, but in a sense, in a nutshell, what Waswa is saying is some of the projects that he's working on require big organizations like KCCA and government uh, because they are complexity and capital comments. What is your advice to the person like him who is funding? Um, okay, what you're trying to get is your project is so big, it's not just the one, one business to business, you're dealing with a government that has lots of other clients and people who are going to use this kind of stuff. And you're asking about whether funding, uh, whether there's some funding available for you. Uh, the funding is available regardless of whether it's a B2B, idea, whether it's a B2C, whether it is just a platform where peers are, are just communicating amongst themselves, uh, whether you're supplying, it doesn't matter what your, who your client is or how big the idea is. Um, the, the funding and grants are available for just about everyone. So I think the best thing is carry on and submit your idea. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. We'll send people in different directions depending on where the idea leads us to send them. Um, can I answer that? Of course you can. Go ahead. Okay, so, so for me, I usually tell people, I think that uh, your first, your first, uh, your first funder is going to be your uh, your customer. So, if you if you really do have the right um, target, uh, if you are hitting the right targets, your first finance is going to come from your customers because they're going to believe in what you're producing. And then, if you say you're going to work with uh, with with with, uh, with government, KCC, and all, you need to speak to the value that they want to listen to. So, what are you bringing on the table? that is going to help them achieve more with your solution, right? So are they going to save on money? Are they going to save on, uh, on human resource and all? So you need to speak to them. Uh, you, need to, you, you, need to, you need to speak to them. Uh, okay, you need to speak to their needs as, a, as, a, as an organization, whether it's KCC, whether it's Ministry of Finance or Health, they have things they look at from day one, right? So is your solution speaking to just those needs? Otherwise, if you just go in and you're talking about how passionate you are about your project, you are not speaking to their needs as an organization. Because cases they would want to save on its budget, uh, they might want to reach more people with, with less resources. Does your solution speak to that? Then those are going to be the first uh, finances of your business. Uh, I don't know whether it makes sense. Yes, it does. Um, and actually, that's very important key. Your first customer really is, is um, is arguably your most important customer because they they confirm to the second and the third and the fourth that this product is actually worth uh, uh, trying out. So um, you might be looking for the big fish, but don't leave the small fish either. Uh, so there's a, two other questions. Hello, Bana. Does the UNDP have an incubation facility, or it only has synergies with direct incubators like Sunbik um, or Moves? And that brings me into another question, which was also by Sandra who was saying, how can you take all the best IT students in the country and create regional accelerator labs? I can ask, I can answer one of the second one. Uh, we are working with Makerere Innovation and Incubation Center to kind of roll out 
uh, the incubation model uh, amongst the different universities so that uh, you have regional centers of excellence from an incubation perspective so that young people, even before they leave university, they're able to uh, realize for so these ideas that we're talking about that they, are, that they have an opportunity for, for these ideas to be incubated. Um, and of course, we will be talking to our uh, partners at the UNDP to hopefully help us realize some of those dreams because the hunger from students in particular has been incredible. They are more student uh, participants in this, in this new idea uh, than non-students who think it's sensible to find them where they are. Bernard, do you want to comment on uh, uh, Tyrell uh, Wamono, who is asking the incubation facility? I know that there's the Standard Business Incubation Center, um, so there's definitely that one. I know that you have a few things in the pipeline. Perhaps if you want to comment on that, Bernard? Okay, um, we don't, in, in, within the UNDP itself, we don't have uh, an incubation center. And maybe as I explained what the accelerator labs do, uh, you, might, you might have thought that we are also uh, an incubation space. Not necessarily. We don't, uh, we don't do what conventionally people who are very good in this space, like let's say Innovation Village, uh, Meek, uh, or Nice. All, all, Oh, nice, yes, do. <laughs> I should have started with you, Dennis. So, or, 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 or nice do that. Uh, this is their space and they own it. What we try to do is create an ecosystem around whatever innovation that you have. And we create all these synergies and partnerships for you to be able to grow and thrive. And that's why we work with people like the Standbeck Incubator, people like NACE. And, and create that environment for your product and for your innovation to be able to grow and thrive. So if that, uh, I hope that answers you a little bit better. Yes, it, it does, uh, which in a nutshell is, um, they need to come back to NACE and we'll help send them in the right direction. <laughs> uh, there's another question from um, uh, Ongol Henry saying, I'm a student of statistics at Makere passionate about ICT and cloud computing, but I've realized, uh, oh, the question has moved. Yeah, I've realized that there is need for ICT from every lowest level, like primary school. So this is not a question. Uh, he's just had an epiphany and realized the importance of ICT. Um, how much are you, this is from Sandra, how much are you investing in computer facilities in rural areas linked to solar support agencies as UNDP? This is an interesting project. Uh, that I'm not sure the UNDP has focused on, uh, but maybe we'll find out an answer on that and, and get back. Um, or, or maybe do you want to respond to that? Uh, Bana, someone is asking whether you, uh, whether there's en been any support uh, in rural areas from a, an ICT point of view. I remember one of the meetings we had, especially given the challenges that young people are facing trying to study in, in, in school with no computers, with no laptops, with no data and things like that. Is there any such a project that the UNDP has been a part of that I think that's what this person is asking? Bana? So in terms of rural areas, we have, um during this period, we haven't directly supported such a project. Um, this is a space that is conventionally done um, <clears throat> by the World Bank and some of the other UN agencies uh, like UNICEF. Uh, this is really, most of the time, <coughs> this is the space which they own. What we have done really is uh, in, term, in the rural areas is trying to help power up uh, some of these health centers using um, a solar to make sure that they are on, they, they are lit and they have some level of uh, lighting energy. But in regard to that, no, as UNDP, we haven't yet uh, done any project uh, in that space. But you might want to check with the World Bank and UNICEF as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Ebaku John Robert is saying thanks for the presentations. You have opened up my mind on preparing my ideas so as to be more competitive. That's very good feedback, really. Thank you very much. That was the whole purpose of uh, these uh, uh, sessions. And I'm very mindful that we're now at 11 a.m. This is the time when we normally uh, kind of wrap up the sessions. Uh, maybe if I could bring all the panelists back on board just to give us their 
final parting uh, shots. But before they do that, uh, please, this is the last session in what has been an incredible two weeks of lockdown, uh, talking about various topics from agriculture to healthcare, to tourism, to smart cities, to minerals, oil and gas, to name it, including today where we were talking about um, ICT. It's been an absolute pleasure having all you guys uh, logging in. We've had numbers of like 470, 200, 300. It varies depending on the topic, but it's been very clear that uh, you guys are engaged your speech tone the kind of questions you're asking uh the chat boxes are always off the hook we've been seeing your emails uh, so far we have about 3400 uh, ideas in various categories so as i mentioned at the beginning of this call the whole of next week the next team is going to be going through these ideas and we'll be reaching out to almost every uh, participant to make sure that uh, if there's any missing information it is captured properly uh to make sure that um, uh, we'll send you some content. Uh, all this content is available on our YouTube channel. If my colleagues could actually put that YouTube channel in the chat box so that individuals can uh, follow up. But also if you go on the website, you will see those channels uh, available on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram. But crucially, uh, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that as we send more content, especially in the masterclass sessions, that you're not left out. Um, and if there's any one of your other friends that has not submitted, the deadline is this week. Uh, and after this, we're closing the, de the, the registrations and then we get into the hands-on aspect of the Youth Ideathon. So I'd like at this point to uh, thank my panelists, but also to bring them on board so that they can give their final parting shots to anyone who is out there, young person, youth, perhaps trying to venture into the space of IT, ICT, what are your parting uh, thoughts? Uh, let's start with uh, Phyllis. Phyllis, final thoughts for the participants on the Youth Idea Fund. Yes, um, to the participants and the public in general, I would like to encourage everyone and let everyone know that anyone can be an innovator, anyone can be an entrepreneur. And to make it in this space, all you have to do is look for the greatest problems that are afflicting the society or the pain problems or the pain points in the population. And from that, you'll create the greatest innovations or the greatest businesses. And you can do anything, whether it's a so-called smaller innovation or a more complex innovation, you can make a lot of impact um, in your society. And to make it big in this space, like I said, it's looking at pain points. I mean, look at COVID. It's, do you really think that Jenna Hubbos is going to advertise much? It speaks for itself because they're addressing a very big pain point in the population. So look at the pain points in your population and be a change maker. Fantastic. Very succinct. Thank you very much, Phyllis, for joining us. Oh, by the way, uh, for all our panelists who are, uh, who are, who are on here, uh, and we're, we're extending the same offer to all our panelists that we've had throughout the two weeks. Uh, if you're interested in mentoring some of the participants, please do let us know uh, by responding to the email that we sent you. Uh, where we had initially planned to only mentor 100 businesses, but as you've seen, <laughs> the Youth Idea Fund has become something else. We now have 3,400 businesses or ideas that we need to mentor. So we are recruiting as many uh, other mentors as possible. So we'd welcome. Uh, an opportunity to have you on board. Thank you very much, uh, Phyllis, for sparing time this morning to join us. Uh, Solomon, what are your final thoughts to the participants? Solomon? Uh, I'm here, I'm here. Anyway, so uh, for me, I'll say, uh, uh, so, so many of us spend a lot of time uh, trying to build things right, or the, uh, instead of building the right thing. So uh, I would advise people to focus on building the right things, not building things right. So for people who write code, you want to go all out and, and have a, a special team. Uh, you want the app to look really beautiful, but you are building the wrong app, yeah? So it's better to focus on uh, building the right product instead of building the product, right? And maybe the other parting shot would be uh, focus your, uh, your life or your hard work on something that you're really passionate about because you're going to spend most of your adult life at work. Thank you. Very good advice. Um, one of the things that entrepreneurs tend to struggle with, or budding entrepreneurs, is waiting for that thing to be very perfect. No. And part of the idea for is really to give you like a sand piece where you can just play with the idea. Who knows what could come out of it? So it's really very good uh, advice, Solomon. Thank you very much for, for
for joining us this morning. And I hope you can also support us as one of the um, mentors and potentially judges when we get to the finals. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I sent you a DM. I don't know whether you saw it. Oh, let me have a look. Bear with me one second. Uh, let me get to Mugi as I check my, my DMs. Uh, uh, Patrick, uh, your parting yeah, shots, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe allow me to give my parting shot using a case study. Go ahead. Um, I don't know how many of the participants or uh, uh, colleagues in the panel who know this uh, Velcro, the Velcro fastening uh, um, uh, thing that normally they put on bugs. I mean, you try to open it has got like, a, uh, I mean, Velcro, I mean, just try to Google it, Velcro. I mean, you try to, uh, you put on a bag, you to open a bag and it makes this funny noise. That the Velcro thing, I'm sure you all know about it. It's very common in bags, in jackets, that kind of thing as a fastener. So maybe, why am I giving this case study? The, the inventor of this uh, of the Velcro was called George de Mistral. He was um, an, a Swiss electrical engineer. This guy was taking a walk with his dog one afternoon. And uh, there are these uh, normally like black jacks. They got attached onto the, uh, the dog as he was coming back. And so he tried to pull them out or from the, the fur of, the, of the, uh, the skin of the dog or whichever. And apparently it came up out to the fur. And that's why the idea of getting a fastener emerged. So after that, he decided to, I mean, being an electro engineer, he had maybe some limited knowledge in this space, maybe how best he could uh, demonstrate this idea and turn it into a product. He went and sought for more support from other experts and he was able to actually develop the Velcro as a fastener. I mean, so you can imagine, uh, it's just because he moved out to the dog, meaning hadn't he taken a stroll with that dog, the dog wouldn't have had this uh, the blackjacks maybe attached onto the fur and the idea wouldn't have been conceived. So what am I trying to mean here is that uh, ideas can emerge at any time. And it's a question of timing and you need to be very articulate. Uh, most uh, the great ideas that turn out to be big adventures in the future or in the society that we are living in now, they're not meant to be so complex, but most of them do have big impact. But you, the innovator or the ideator, you need to be very keen and uh, just remember that uh, Ideas will always have value. And IP can actually get that value out of that idea. I look forward to having more IPs emerge from this idea thon. And you are going to walk this journey with you even after the idea thon. We know the IP process and its acquisition is quite lengthy. But I think UNDP and NES, you should actually be able to create a platform support these guys acquire their IPs. And we shall help you in the technical support on that because it requires lots of financing to make that happen. God bless you. Let's, we meet on second for the showdown in the bootcamp for IP. Thank you, thank you very much. Those are real parting shots. Yes, it's going to be a proper showdown because yeah. we are really excited. Some of the ideas we're looking at are not quite, they're not entry level ideas, these are really, very good ideas. And um, regarding that platform that you're talking about, we are working on one, it's going to keep developing. And we look forward to having further discussions on how this can actually be made much bigger. In fact, we are also planning to have uh, digital content embedded in it. So it's like a one-stop place center, but uh, all you guys know the cost implications of delivering this kind of platforms. So we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, Solomon, uh, if you could kindly resend the DM uh, directly to me, I can't seem to see it. But in the meantime, lastly, but by no means least, allow me to invite Bana uh, from the UNDP. And it's very befitting that you should be the last person uh, to give your last parting shots. Uh, but before you do that, I would like to thank you, 
personally, I would like to thank Hadija, I would like to thank Deborah, I would like to thank Innocent, I would like to thank Albert, Ashley, the whole crew at the UNDP for the amount of support, including the, the resident representative herself, uh, the passion with which you've supported us, your hearts have been in it, you've been with us on every one of these thematic sessions. Uh, I love the way we've been engaging uh, in the background. Uh, clearly, you all love innovation, you love creativity, you love entrepreneurship, you love what you do, supporting young people and seeing these things come to life. So on behalf of the NACE team, and as well as all our other uh, support partners, I'd like to thank you really, genuinely from the bottom of our hearts for uh, how flexible you've been with us, how you've uh, been able to help us to pivot faster than uh, you would normally do. This is the UN and usually it's, it's like moving a track. It's very hard to get you to move, but with the idea thrown, especially with lockdown pending, you moved, uh, you supported us to move very quickly. And the idea for us ended up being more impactful because lots of eyeballs are at home watching what we're doing. So I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of NACE uh, and look forward to seeing the next phase of how this develops, not just this year, but in the coming years. So your parting shots, Banner. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis, and the team from NACE, uh, Celeste Media, Penda Capital, Test Advisory, all of you have done quite an amazing job in running these thematic sessions. I have learned so much. If, if, if you thought you knew something, all that has been erased and we have learned so much starting from last week. It has been quite interesting. Most of the time, the first thing I do is I look at the number of participants and match them to the thematic sessions to try and see how much interest do the youth have in this specific spaces i was quite surprised to see how many youth are interested in agriculture and yeah that's usually, surprised and, me too yes it's a coincidence a lot of times we had this notion that ah they would probably not be interested in it and in almost all these other spaces so we thank you very very much for empowering these young people and for allowing them to express all their talents covid without a doubt has brought so many challenges but it has also brought immense opportunities for us, especially for the people who are working in this space. If there's ever been a time when your need has been validated, it is this last two years. It is these last two years because you have had an opportunity to do so many things. If you wanted to design a platform like Zoom where people interact, you are free. If you wanted to, you know, to do a, 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 anything on, in the, on the internet or in this space, your need has been validated in 2020 and 2021. So our, specifically to our innovators in this same space that personally I'm very passionate about, this is your time. This is your time to shine. This is your time to rise and show what you can do. Do not be afraid. Make sure that you can bring on board all your ideas. Go to, you still have, I think, a few hours to go to the link that uh, I'm sure Jimmy is going to post again uh, in the in the chat sure. to ensure that you apply, apply, make sure your idea is seen, make sure that it is also, uh, it, it, uh, if you need to tweak it after this session, please do tweak it and, and apply and apply to this, uh, to this call. You just never know where your idea will take you. Also to um, the young people out there, I know a lot of times we are, we are misconstrued, those of us who are the youth, uh, Dennis, as we are still youth, those of us who are still the youth, a lot of times we are, uh, we are misconstrued, but do not be afraid to hunger for knowledge and to make sure that your place and, um, and, your, and your presence is felt in this arena. And also for us who are parents, let's teach our children to hunger for knowledge. Times are changing, everything has changed. For example, we might never need to have office spaces right now. NACE may never need to, to spend thousands of dollars in an office because after these two years of working from home and realizing that people can deliver, even when they are not there, things will probably, be, will probably change. The new normal will be different, but continue, continue to adapt, continue to change. I remember we, um, in the telecoms, we used to have a famous saying that you either innovate or you die because yes, or we die. If we don't innovate, we die because you had to produce products and services that were relevant to the customer. Today's customer is very impatient. They want things at the click of a button. 
So, and they want convenience. Convenience is at the top of their need. So try and uh, try and figure out what your customers, as you're trying to solve this problem, as you're trying to bring this service, what other people need, what is their need at this point in time. And please to even the people who, I, I also, I like to speak to the people who are out there who may not have access to all these facilities, try and utilize all the innovation you can to get to these spaces. I know there are people who have no electricity, who have no data, who have no what. We are thinking about you. And one day we shall reach you. So yeah. thank you very much, Dennis. Unfortunately, we'll have to drop off for another meeting, but we appreciate everything that you have done. We are eternally grateful. We have learned so much from this, from all this process that uh, Nace and team have run. And um, I know we are going to soar to even higher and higher and higher horizons from here on. So thank you and have a remaining uh, good session and a lovely weekend to everybody. Thank you very much, Ivana. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, everyone, including our panelists especially, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my team as well for always being there. Uh, Jimmy Biaranga, who's always holding my back. Uh, Ivy, who's been doing a lot of the communications Brenda has been doing a lot of the registrations. Uh, we did a lot of uh, web stuff uh, together with Miracle in the background. I could go on and on and on. The whole team has been really very helpful. So on behalf of the NACE team and on behalf of the UNDP Youth Idea Fund, I'd like to thank everyone for having participated. And please do go to the website. And I'll repeat that website again, as I ask my colleagues to share the uh, social web links in the chat as well. It's undp.nase.co.ug and you should find all the information you need about all the thematic sessions that we've held. There should be some videos there. You go onto our YouTube channel, you'll find all the content there as well. Uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, like us on Twitter, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Instagram, all the way on social media. So thank you very much everyone for joining us. And lastly, but by no means least, to our uh, sign language uh, uh, helpers, not just today, but for since we started last week, we are still going to have their services in the uh, masterclass sessions. So any people with disabilities, we're also going to be using the text that you can see. So please do join us on the fifth, but in the meantime, check your emails, check your inboxes, check your spam as well, because some messages have been going into spam. Uh, and then we'll look forward to seeing you or on the fifth, when we begin the masterclass sessions, where one of you will win a hundred million shillings worth of grants and seed investment into your business and go on to enjoy six months incubation support, thanks to our partners at the United Nations Development Program. So thank you. Have a good day. Stay safe.